Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, people will be straggling in. That's fine. Uh, it, this is a great opportunity for us to talk about something that we as journalists should and as just plain old human beings trying to understand what's happening around us in our very confused and crazy world uh, should take this opportunity and, um, and try to ask as many honest questions as we can. So I encourage you to um, uh, reach down deep inside and don't worry about being polite. We'll, uh, we'll worry about that, <laughs> David and I. Um, we're very privileged to have with us two people that if there is anybody who can explain to us Columbine, there are two people sitting in front of you here that know this event probably better than anybody else in the entire country. Uh, I remember when I was a journalist um, uh, in 1999. Uh, I'm still a journalist, by the way. Uh, I was working for the Wall Street Journal, and at that time, on April 20th, 1999, I had to make these calls because we talked in the office to our editors and to other reporters, and none of us could really come up with how to cover the story. It was breaking about halfway across the country, and we just didn't really know how to approach the subject because up until that time, Crime has been basically consigned to bad guys. Bad guys committed crimes, and they came from bad neighborhoods, and they lived in poverty. They had very poor education. They had drugs to deal, to deal with, and that whole culture, and they had gang members to give them moral principles to live by. And that was more or less the type of crimes that we were used to covering. But suddenly, crimes in Columbine switched to good guys. And the good guys who were coming from good educations, from good economic backgrounds, coming from um, upright, moral, middle-class families who were committing these crimes. We didn't know how to cover it. I got on the phone. I remember getting on the phone and saying to the people, to the families in, Little, in Littleton and in other parts of Colorado, I'm sorry for calling you at this time, please, because there's nobody else I can speak to. Nobody else is an expert. We don't really know what's happening in this country. You are the only ones who could shed some light for us. And um, some of them hung up on me. And some of them tried to answer the questions. But what we have here in PJ Paparelli, who's the co-author of Columbinus, a great play. I saw it last night. I was really impressed. And we have Betty Schultz, who is the grandmother of a victim in Columbine. The aunt. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the aunt. Uh, excuse me. The aunt of uh, a victim in Columbine, Isaiah Schultz. Uh, they are here, they've lived this for the last 14 years. P.J. Paparelli has spent, uh, he spent four years researching and reporting this as if he was a journalist in order to come up with the first two acts. And then after that, he researched it more. He knows the families inside and out in Colorado. And um, here's a great opportunity to pick his brain. He is, uh, by profession, a director. He's involved with theater companies from Alaska to Washington. and. Um, he, he's produced a whole bunch of Shakespearean uh, plays, Hamlet, uh, Twelfth Night, uh, Much to Do About Nothing, on and on and on. And he's- Hair. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Hair. Hair. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, want, I want to say, I, I want to open up to you, I, I want you to be as curious as possible for the next hour or so. It's too bad we don't have all day to talk about this, but I want to say a couple of things that crossed my mind as I was watching this great play last night. One is that I'm not given to hyperbole usually because I'm a journalist. I have to low-key everything. Uh, I thought, when I was watching the play yesterday, I thought of the book of Revelations because of the prophetic element, the prophetic message that the book of Revelations was about a chaotic time of evil. And I want to point out to you that a year ago, in July of 2012, when PJ, may I call you PJ? Or should I call you God, yes. <laughs> when he, he looks so you, you can call me worse. You distinguish. It's called exhausting. When PJ was getting ready to uh, research Act 3 of this three part play, I mean, this three act play, uh, he was getting ready to go to. Colorado, and he had to cancel his trip because on April 20th of last year, we all know what happened. 
in a theater about 15 minutes away from Columbine, there was a ma massive, uh, uh, ma uh, mass shooting. We all know what that is. And that was last year. Fast forward to right now, this week. What happened this week? We all know what happened this week in the nation's capital. And I might surprise you, between July of last year and now, guess how many mass shootings there have been in this country? And by mass shootings, we define it as any event in which five or more people died, were killed. Anybody want to make a guess? 66. Uh, no, not that many. Uh, <laughs> 10. There have been 10 mass shootings in the United States since then. And I'm not including the Boston Marathon bombing. Because Boston Marathon bombing, as grisly as it was, only had three deaths, even though 264 people were injured in that. And so we're dealing with uh, a, 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 a play here that is very relevant to us. And we should ask at some point, PJ, what role, he's a playwright by profession, but at the same time he's now, he's a journalist. He's, he's gotten into our world and he's, and he's created a new genre. It's almost like nonfiction writing. Uh, nonfiction writing to, to, to many people is journalism. And so I, I want all of you to, to think about that in Cold Blood could have, been a, um, could have been another title for this because both uh, pieces of work, both pieces of literary work are dealing with the same subject, which is the inexplicable, inscrutable ability of man to commit evil. And I think that there's lots of things here that we should talk about. And one final thing, Columbine has been probably studied more than any other mass shooting in this country. And we thank people like PJ and Betty for that because they have really contributed to that understanding over the last 14 years. And if there is a solution, we have come up with all kinds of solutions. We looked at the Second Amendment, we looked at, we've looked at gun control, we've looked at uh, social, uh, socioeconomic, we looked at teenage angst and alienation, we've looked at a lot of stuff. We looked at video games, Hollywood, uh, media violence. And there is some of those things we have no control over. But there is something that we have control over. And the answer lies in Columbine. And it's too bad that the Browns, who, uh, who are the parents of a survivor of Columbine, couldn't make it today because their son was really someone that has a very interesting twist to the Columbine story. Those of you who are not familiar with it, I'm going to tell you very briefly. I don't want to spoil it for your play, your great play. I'll tell you very briefly, but their son, Brooks Brown, was targeted by the two shooters a year before Columbine happened. And he, if anybody in that school, he should have been killed first. But in a very ironic twist and in a sort of a moral to this uh, lesson to this play, he escapes death. The two shooters look him in the face and say, get out of here before they started their killing spree. And, and the answer and how he escaped this mass shooting is really very, very intriguing. I think we, if we delve more into that story uh, and hear the people to, t to talk to you about it, we will really try to understand how we can avoid shootings like this as best as we can. I'm not making any promises. There's probably going to be another shooting soon. I don't want pessimistic. I'm a journalist. But I want to open up the floor to everybody here. I'm glad you're here. Please open up your thinking caps and uh, fire away. Uh, let me start off uh, asking you a question, and then we can. This is a great piece of journalism. Can you explain to us how you've mentioned two things? You said this is not a play, but this is a theatrical discussion. What is a theatrical discussion? Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank you, Joe, for having me, and it's just a privilege being here with this wonderful woman. And uh, and I hope you will ask questions of us, of, uh, of our, our experience, which is very, very different. I'm an outsider, just like you. I, I am an outsider. I did not experience what happened in Littleton 14 years ago, but Betty did, and uh, it hit home. Um, and uh, so our perspectives are obviously very, very different, and that's a part of journalism is perspective, right? It's it's whose perspective are you, are you telling? What what? How, as a journalist, you, you are responsible for examining an event that happens to us? 
and what, what is truth, right? That's the biggest question, what is actually true? There's a truth that I have as an outsider from my experience, and there's a very different truth that Betty has as an insider. Um, and so the impetus for the play, I mentioned that because the journalism was really at the heart of why we even did what we did. Um, it was 2002, the Iraq war had, had, just been, had just taken off, and there were a group of artists that were in DC that were very rattled about what w the way we got into the war and the reasons that American people were sort of being told. And we had an agenda, but it was sort of interesting to say, well, what if we got rid of that agenda and saying the war is wrong and just kind of looking at this particular event and how we got in it and trying to weigh both sides. And can you create a piece of writing, piece of journalism, a piece of theater that presents both sides in dialogue with each other and then let the audience go away and sort of, you know, whatever camp they're on, be able to process it and feel that it's important to them instead of dismiss it and say, well, that's propaganda for one side, propaganda for the other. Um, which is, I think, what a journalist should be doing is trying to tell the truth in the best way he or she can by presenting multiple perspectives to something. So uh, typically, as a theater artist, you're coming in and you're filtering an experience through your experience. And um, I don't think there's any way to be 100% objective. I mean, obviously, there's things we chose to put in and not put in. But what, what we try to continually to return to is, are there enough perspectives? Are the, ba are, are the perspectives balanced? Um, and that was actually a really, really difficult thing, both in journalism as well as writing this play, because you, you, you might be drawn and connected to one particular side or one particular point of view and feel like that hits home and that's the one I want to think about. Um, but, but we continually had to remind my, ourselves, no, we couldn't do that. We had to, while we had our own opinions, right, our responsibility was to try to arrange as many opinions as we can without making the play so cumbersome that you're, you know, you can't follow a story or it's too lugubrious. So that was our, our immediate intention. So we started with wanting to write about the Iraq War, and the issue with the Iraq War for us is we couldn't find one story at the heart of it. There were 16 different stories at the heart of it. There wasn't one event other than getting into the war, but is that, you know, it, it became, how do we tell one story? Because the play, you know, at the heart of it has to be a story. There has to be one, of, I think, one event that everything's anchored or drawn to. So we, we, we got frustrated, to be honest. We didn't feel like we could do it well. And um, we abandoned it. And we were sitting all around, there's four of us sitting around going, well, what are other American issues that just, you know, aren't, don't have a clear answer and want to be talked about? And immediately I said, you know, this, com this thing that happened at Kalma, which was only a couple of years after, it just continues to haunt me that how could two teenagers get to the place where they, you know, in a, in a very, very premeditated way, um, do the things that they did. Nothing about Columbine was accidental. You know, they didn't just decide to do it a week before, it was a year before. And their motivations for who they killed, while there were people that they didn't know, there was definitely clear motivations on uh, targeting the school itself. You know, if someone's frustrated and angry and wants to commit violence, there's so many places to do that. They chose their school as the target, which is not random, it was very specific. And some of the deaths and the way that people died, which the play reveals, um, were very specific. So uh, there was nothing random about Columbine. The only thing that didn't go the way, it was, what, way they had planned it to go was actually, they were planning to blow up the school. They had placed propane bombs and support, um, support pillars of the cafeteria, which, which um, the library sits above the cafeteria. And the idea was, at the moment where the most students were eating lunch or studying in the library, they'd blow up the support sp pillars and kill you know, upwards of nine, nine, 900 to 1,000 people. And because they wired the bombs wrong, really a random thing that happened is why they didn't go off. Um, and so then they resorted to using the guns that they had brought really to shoot people as they exited the school. Um, uh, that anybody who would have survived the explosion. Um, and that didn't happen, thank God, that that didn't happen. I mean, it was horrible what happened at Columbine, but it was so much bigger. And all of that, again, had been premeditated. Um, so we switched to this idea of doing, studying Columbine because at the heart of it was this question, what, two questions really. What, what happened in Littleton? What happened, why would, what drive these two boys to do that? 
And the bigger question, is there something going on in adolescence today that is, that is causing a certain amount of disconnection? Not necessarily causing school shootings, because I, that's, in some ways, if you're gonna try to solve that, and Joe alluded to this, you're gonna chase a dragon you'll never catch. It's not about how do we prevent a school shooting. It's really about why these things are happening. Why do people choose a violent way of, of releasing something that's inside them? The series of disconnections and, um, and uh, a built up, when you have a lack of communication and there's this build up that's happening and then it gets released in this certain way, whether that's you know one gun, whether that's a mass shooting, whether that's a bomb, whether that's abuse, whether there's so many different ways that we're violent in this society. Um, I think the question is, is there something in today's adolescence, uh, 10 years ago now, uh, today's adolescence that, uh, that are causing um, young people to feel this sense of disconnection and loneliness? Um, so there's really two questions at the heart of Columbine. Is. So anyway, those, that's what we did, that's what we were after, that's what we wanted to try to solve. What happened in Littleton? Why did they do it? We will never know. It went down with them. They took that. And even so, what they have left us, their videos, um, and this is interesting from a journalistic point of view, those videos which have been, you know, only some of the families have, have seen them, and a few reporters, and they have been locked up forever um, because they were very worried about copycat. And, uh, and when, if, when you read the transcripts, or the, for those who've seen the videos that I've spoken with, you know, they are, they are that version of the truth that the boys wanted the world to see, you know, that they wanted to be famous. That was their version of what happened, their version of why they were doing it. That has to sit alongside of what they probably do not want you to see, which are the things that, what was really motivating their fears, their insecurities, their, you know, and then their illness, because they were both ill people. Um, None of this is to excuse an evil act, is to understand all of the things that go into that. So, like I said, I don't think I'll ever really know why Columbine happened. Most survivors say it's a perfect storm, you know, five or six, seven different things that didn't happen all at the same time. More so why it couldn't have been prevented because of all these different things. But I will say, if any one of those things might have been followed through on, yes, we probably would have stopped it from but it doesn't explain to you necessarily why, 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 that's a tough question. So I think as a journalist, you try to present as many opinions of that as you can, and then have an audience really leave that, kind of taking it in for themselves. So that was the impetus why we, why we wrote it and, um, and what we were hoping to achieve. Could I ask, uh, I'm uh, David Dower, I'm the, the Director of Artistic Programs for Arts Emerson, uh, and uh, Part of um, we're programming Columbine, and this is part of a whole series of things. And I want to ask uh, Betty a question uh, from that standpoint, picking up right where you left off. This this responsibility of the journalist to present multiple points of view. A, how has that impacted your uh, experience of what you? I mean, it's a very personal experience that's playing out very publicly. Probably continues to. You continue to talk about this yes. all over the place. How has, how has that, um, that sense that we have to keep opening to many truths um, manifested in your attempt to tell your truth? Well, um, I believe uh, the impact is that most of the media that I had came into contact, and the way we perceive the media is not always in their favor. I refuse to do interviews because I have to feel the person and how you approach me and what history you have in, in, in uh, doing a story or projecting the truth. I have found in my experience that I can tell, like <laughs> PJ, I can tell within a 10 minute period if I'm going to even continue to talk to you. There has only been one reporter that was able to get the inside story for me because I automatic distrust. When I see you have a history of not telling the truth 
uh, you tell what someone wants to hear and not the need of the people to hear the whole truth and what caused the incident. I believe that the news is written today to satisfy the majority of people what they want to hear, not what they should. I entrust the media to tell the truth, to get the inside and tell the whole, the whole story as it went. And one thing I believe is uh, they have a, the media has a responsibility. Even before Columbine, I feel that they had a responsibility to give me the truth, to tell the stories as it happened. Don't doctor the truth to make everybody feel good, you know? You have to be able to stand there and give the people what they deserve, what they expect from you. And the majority doing the Columbine incident, they didn't want to to fit in, you know, they, they wanted to, this big picture of what the world want to hear, they, that's why it took so long for the people to get the truth. So I decided I'm not going to do any interviews, only the people I trust. If I talk to you within 10 minutes, I can tell your personality, I can tell your spirit, I can tell if it's going to benefit the young, you know, and young people's able, as you being young, is able to see if somebody's been honest with them, uh, how you approach that, you know, the causes. If they catch you in a lie from the beginning, why should they listen to anything else you have to say? If they know that you are avoiding the truth, why should they even pay attention to the next story? I think the media has the biggest impact on the young today because they're watching what's happening in the world. And my belief is all the killers and, and, and the shootings is happening for those persons because the media have built them up as being glorified. They will go down being remembered as what they did, you know, the bad, and instead of the victims and the solutions. So that's the biggest impact I see today. And with the play, it has made one of the biggest impact that I was willing and able and excited to get involved with. Uh, it tells a, a lot of people's stories, not only Columbine. Uh, it tells how kids are being treated or whatever, and I could see everybody, everybody fitting into one of the groups at the play. It tells a life story. It don't only tell my story or Isaiah's story or the other kid's story. It tells something that the world could relate to. That's why I'm here today and that I'm able to talk to you guys. Um, the play, it, it, it impacts, and this is the first truthful any, uh, play or anything written that was so truthful close to the truth that you can sit there and say, oh yes, you know, sometimes it gets hard to look, but it's the truth. So uh, this play impacted me so well, you know, I got excited about sharing again. So that's why I'm here. I, I got excited about if I can help someone, I'm here. So, uh, you know, you guys have such a job to do. and. Right today, I depend on the news to give me the facts. I need facts. My mind, and I know so many kids are so smart, they can see through all the sugar coatings of <laughs> stories. And, and if you're going to be go approach somebody, approach them correctly. You know what I'm saying? Don't prejudge somebody if you're going to step up and want to give their life stories on the news. You have to be real for yourself. If I, I feel you're a failure if you go into somebody pretending, because I can tell somebody right off if they going through this pretense stage or whatever, they're trying to impress somebody. First of all, I feel like you have to put yourself into that situation 
and then you know where to go from that. It's easy as that. I think it's interesting that Betty hit it right out of the nose. There are people who just didn't talk to us years ago. We started in 2002. In fact, I, because of some of the experiences I had, I, I actually never approached Betty or her family years ago because I was so, you know, I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> as a journalist. I mean, and I was so worried that I would offend. Um, and it was so, such a sensitive thing. Um, and uh, it was just, I think years later, and just some experience failing <laughs> quite a bit, to, to, you know, to be able to talk to Betty and share and listen to the stories. Um, but I think one thing I learned on this experience is it's all about trust. And it's all about some of the best stories I have on Columbine. This is where the journalist actually failed in some ways. Because in the journalist, you want the best story to put in the paper, right? The best stories of, that I have on Columbine, none of them are in the because I didn't want, the families didn't want them in. And I respected that. It was not about getting the best story. Of course, you want to be able to share that, but it's up to the family at the end of the day what they want to share. And they're telling me so that they can understand context, so I can understand the whole picture. But they trusted that, you know, that I was only gonna put what they wanted to have in the play. And so that was a that's a weird thing. It, to be honest, it's a very weird thing as a journalist or a playwright because you want that juicy, you know, whatever it is. But you have to kind of think of the whole, because those choices, if you make those choices by putting that sensational thing in there, you're burning a bridge inside of a community. You could, you could burn a bridge inside of a community. So trust was, and I, and I you know, we failed at that by the way we approached somebody maybe too soon at something, or it took a long time. So. I think that's the difference between pure journalism because you have to report on an event immediately versus what we were trying to do, which took years. I mean, Columbine, the, the first, I think, I don't know if you know, but the play used to be just a two-act play, and it was finished in 2004. So it took, you know, almost three years, 2005 rather, it took about three years to write the play, and mainly because you're not gonna go out there, get your story, and then leave, I mean, which is, and then a wonderful thing happens. You, you, be, you, by getting to know people and, and really seeing a truth beyond what they're gonna initially tell you. Because there's always the first interview and it's like, this is what I want you, this is how I want you to perceive me. I'm gonna tell you that, right? I'm gonna give you the quote. Because I don't trust you. So if people are used to talking to the media, they go, here's your sound bite. This happened quite a bit. Uh, police, <laughs> unfortunately. Columbine, you know, they were like, this is the first, this is what I want you to take from it. Mm -hmm. So it really takes the third, the fourth, the fifth interview for per people to get disarmed and eventually start to like, you know, share something. And then there's things they're gonna say, I don't want you to write that, but I want you to understand it. Cause I ultimately would hope that you're going to represent me in a fair way. So that it's time consuming. It's just really time consuming to do what we, we were trying to do. And, you know, some things we were successful at. We never got a chance to talk to the, the families of the two shooters. Um, in fact, the Harrises have only, I think they've only talked to the Mausers. I think they've only talked to one. Oh, uh, yes, because I, I don't know. I, I tried to approach their families, the, the families of the two shooters, uh, because I, I really uh, feel like I should forgive them and uh, the, the families was hurting uh, because they lost a child. Uh, I put myself, as I'm asking you guys, to put yourself in that position, and it's it's all within a couple of minutes. If you how you approach somebody, I I could tell uh, in ten minutes that I trusted PJ, <laughs> and after everybody knew that I trusted PJ, it was wonderful because. If I, some friends of mine told me about him and they love him and they say, you love him, just give him a chance to talk. But you have to realize I, uh, I have been approached by so many people and their first impression is, I'm not talking to these people, why? You're not gonna tell the truth. You're not gonna tell the world the truth. If, if I thought you was gonna portray the truth in the matter, I would tell it to you. I'm not gonna take any more time or anything, but the best person gets the story. If you 
you approach a person as another human being and you will get everything you need. Uh, and I think it would be more beneficial to the world than all this, the misstatements and everything else that's been printed. Uh, I was willing to tell him stories and everything that I was feeling. I opened up to him and all the other families because he's that type of person. It's the whole approach, you, and um, and it's exciting to be here because you guys are the future and what is going to happen. I've been contacted by so many of the families that's been in the other tragedies and spoke to so many people. I believe in God utmost, and they know that part of me. And I'm very spiritual in that manner. So I'll sit up and talk to you at 2 or 3 at 4 o'clock in the morning. If they see that you have an open heart to them, they be, I mean, you'll be able to get the story. You'll be able to portray it, and you'll be able to help the next young person. I, that's what I truly believe. You guys are the start of the end. And I believe with the way everything stirs is portrayed, nobody would want to go out here and glorify themselves by killing up a lot of kids and hurting the world if they can get the they can get the glory in other ways. You know, we have to put that to them. There's other ways to get fame and fortune and whatever. You know, and I believe that's the problem right now with all the shooters. You know, no, not enough attention. The media gives them too much attention, you know? Instead of uh, looking at the victims and seeing the life and, and the film portrayed, uh, the Columbine film portrayed that, but your film, <laughs> it's told a lot of the truth. And that's what the kids need is the truth. They need the young people, even the older people, you know, they even start after seeing the play and everything start giving more respect to the next person because uh, everybody don't even realize the truth. Some, I mean, right now, you know, one of you guys approached me and said, could you give me the whole truth? There's so much truth that you guys haven't heard because I haven't found anybody to trust to tell the truth. And the other families have tried to give me to tell their story of the other shootings and everything but until I find the right person. I've tried to talk him into some other things, but. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, when you see yourself uh -huh. in the play now, is, uh -huh. that, uh, is that a true uh, story of you? In, in, did, did, does the, the most truthful that it has been in any of the yeah. media stories, yes. That's interesting. Yes. With all the interviews and all, all the, the hours of flying and talking and. I avoided the media. I did some interviews. I did some massive interviews. I met with the president. I did all that, but uh, some of the media I refused to talk to. <laughs> How long did you talk to PJ? We, we had a lot. It, took, it took 10 minutes for me to trust him. And he could get any kind of story he wants from me because <laughs> I truly trust him. You know, I trust that he would have my interests. I trust him that he would tell the story so it could benefit somebody else. You know, so yeah, I, I would do anything, you know, any story, any place, any time. And I love Kevin <laughs> over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I love his heart and a couple of more of the guys I met today, I mean, it's like, oh my God, you know, there's still people out here that that truly care and don't, and we can tell automatic if you care or if you sympathize or you out here just trying to get a story and you go make up your own anyway. So uh, we do know, we do know the impact on us. We, we can tell automatic. It takes a couple of minutes to even be around you guys and I can tell you, am I going to take this time? I got to the point now, I don't even have time for <laughs> so it, it's how you approach someone and how, you know, your, uh, your history of do reporting or even, you know, sitting down to conference or any matter you're in, you know, people are truly, truly blessed if they can discern 
And I believe after 14 years, I have good to serve. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the impact of media is the uh, biggest impact, in my opinion, that you can have during a tragedy. I, I believe that uh, you guys give the first picture, you guys give what the ending is going to be of the whole story, you know, from the, the first words you give is what it's going to end up being. You know, it, you can either make it or break it. Yeah, we write the first draft of history. Mm -hmm. You We're do. the first historians on the scene, we have absolutely no background. We come <laughs> to you. Exactly. Uh, you want to take some questions? Please, 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 please. Let's see, who should we go with? Um, let's start from the front. Go ahead. Okay. Identify yourself then. Stephen Karam and I, who co-wrote the first act, uh, we both are from Scranton, and so our uni the university there decided to do it, and so we felt we should go. It was one of the most horrific experiences that I've ever had in the theater. Um, and this is my first play. I've, I've, I hadn't written one before this, and it was so un <laughs> so unnerving because the directing of the play, right, the way that you direct the actors, you know, the way that, because I had been in all the interviews and I really knew it was to me as a playwright going, where where you wanted a piece of fiction or a piece of, you know, cre a piece of fiction that you imagined. You want your other artists to kind of take their liberties and go. With this, I had the complete opposite feeling. I was like, I hope to God Betty or somebody wouldn't come to see. Not because anybody did anything wrong or, or were trying to do something wrong. It's just, it's just words. It's their words, and so it's how you interpret it and how the director and the actor interpret that. It's very easy. To to you know to swing any one of those things to the point where it, it's way out of context and it becomes you know a call to arms you know anything so that was such a such a terrifying <laughs> terrifying experience I was like I never wanted the families to see it <laughs> but see I told PJ you do whatever you want to do how you want to portray me or how because that trust issue. I, you know, even if he would make mistakes, that's understandable because we all make mistakes. But like that trust, stepping into an agreement is what gonna cause you to complete it or be, what? Uh, 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 <laughs> complete the job you go after or fail at it. And be successful at that or fail. I, and I would feel the same way if I did. If I just had like five minutes and got three quotes from Betty, I don't think I actually could do. It'd be an entirely different character, right? I, I mean, it took us talking and eating and talking and eating and talking, um, uh, and to just get to know each other on both ends. And I think that led to the piece being a little more, you know, well-rounded. This is actually a little tangential to the topic, but I worked on a play for many years on uh, another horrific event, the uh, People's Temple in Jonestown, uh, with the survivors of Jonestown. And uh, we, one of the um, more uh, known survivors, she's the most popular book uh, on the topic, at the time I think still does, uh, she came to us and said, I want to be in the play, I'm gonna sell you the rights to my book. Everyone else came saying, thank you for listening, and we listened for hours and hours and hours. Some people uh, have more than 70 hours of interview on tape, and that's just what was on tape. 
And so when you talk about that first moment of coming correct or not, that person's story is nowhere in the play. She's still offended about that because she is the sort of official spokesperson, but it was because her approach to the project also didn't come correct. And in a way it was, I will sell you my official version and that's what you can use. And, and that, in the, it, so it does go in this, you know, both directions Absolutely. when when you're starting. You just said it, if, if you, at the beginning, if that trust is firm and if that trust is true, then you've completed your anxieties about it. At yeah. that point, you yeah. everybody go. But it has to start from, we started together at the right place, in the right way, and, and now we go. And what really backs me up is somebody who comes and offer you value of your life story. I have had so many offers to do books and <laughs> movies <laughs> and everything. But uh, it's not really in hard, it's not that at all. I wouldn't accept, I wouldn't even accept an assignment or anything if that's all they thought of me is accepting money. So when you approach people, don't just think money is going to work for everything because you can't buy love with money. You can't <laughs> buy the personal feelings. And especially like me, all you want is the truth to get out, you know, and it, maybe it helps somebody. That's my goal in life. And I pray that everybody would understand that, you know, it's the approach. You seem to really be burning up with a oh, question. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Zach, I'm the senior political science and screenwriting major. Um, I wanted to, something you were talking about before, Betty, was the idea of responsible coverage, and I wanted to ask about that because I saw this piece a while ago um, by this British journalist and comedian who basically made the case that these shootings are happening more and more frequently, unfortunately, and the responsible thing to do would be basically do no coverage of the shooters ever. The responsible thing to do would be don't release the names, don't release the faces, you know, don't, don't do any of that. Uh, but there's also, you know, there's sort of the other end of the spectrum, which is that, well, people want to know this stuff, and if they, people do know this stuff, it helps them understand, you know, it can help us treat the problem if we know what, what kind of, what these people have been suffering and what led them down this path. So this is, this is, I mean, I think it sort of speaks specifically to what you were talking about earlier, but just for all of you, is there a middle ground, or should we not be covering these shooters at all, or what, what's the responsible thing That's to do? That's a pretty tough question, yeah. Yeah. You're being, you're being asked whether or not the story should be out there. Okay, but, okay, I have an answer for that. Sure. I, I feel like the people should know everything. But when a shooting happened, is what I'm saying, everybody, the only people you see is the shooter and uh, their story, you know, instead of telling, getting the information out there and putting it back, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 putting it up there, the victims and, and what the families, more so on them. And then I think some of the glorification might go away. Because uh, you turn on the TV or newspaper, all you see is the shooters or uh, the one who did the crime. So I think the emphasis should be on moral on prevention and, and all that. That would get spray them a long way. It's, it's, it's my opinion. No, I think that is right. I think, you know, it, it's hard when a tragedy hits. I mean, you have a community that's in shock. I mean, my God, like Littleton or Boston. Or, I mean, you're in a community that's in shock. And so you're trying to find the balance of, it, are, we, are, are people ready or can they reveal, you know, what, 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 what certain amount of truth is going to be able to be revealed in the immediate Moments. I don't. I don't think it. It took years, and oh my God, five to really seven years after Columbine for major amounts of truth to come out because people were keeping things from from because they were so worried about lawsuits. I mean, and so I mean, when we're talking about the shooters, I, yes, of course, there needs to be a middle ground. Sensational. There's a thing about. For me, it's like, what's gonna get a rise out of my audience, right? I know the things that will go, <gasps> you know what I mean, and draw me in that way, versus a, a more long-term draw in, which is about balance, you know what I mean, and building the story more carefully. You know, unfortunately, journalism has come into what can grab my attention, right? And, and not trusting or not building a society where, where we can build the blocks of balance and build a story that's more complicated and more layered. 
I used to read the in story the, the Washington Post stories around Watergate. Yeah. Just look at the water, Washington Post stories around Watergate, you know, 30, 40 years ago versus what's in the paper now. You know what I mean? And it's so interesting how things are, the stories are laid out. And we, it, it, like, we're not going to journal, so many journals, not all of them, so many journals just don't trust that we're an intelligent society and that we can balance those, th those things. So we go for an emotional reaction instead of stimulating emotion and intellect at the same time. You know. But somebody like me, like uh, the Boston Marathon, I was sitting there and said, I want to hear more about that baby. I, I don't want to hear about them. You know, I was sitting there, I was saying, I want to know about the kids. If you can, some kids was there waiting on their parents. I want to hear about them. I was upset about not hearing their condition and, and all that. That's what I be focused on, you know, and, and, and I believe there is a lot more like me. <laughs> but to get back to uh, uh, the uh, trust issue, without the trust with the group of people like the Columbine families, you're not gonna get very far. You know, you only got told what they even imagined. The truth took years to come out. When it could have, somebody, a great reporter could have came and got the full story. All right. Can I ask you about something? In, in, mm -hmm. in my, uh, so my neighborhood, um, my neighbor was the family in the marathon who's lost their son. Sure. And I went out the next morning and a young journalist uh, standing on the street waiting for somebody to come out. I was on my way to work. And she asked me for a comment on the family. And I didn't feel I had any right to comment on the family, so I said no. She followed me for most of a block, and then finally she said, well, where's the school? I wanted to, maybe I could talk to the teachers. And I felt like, in that moment, I, I, I didn't tell her, I didn't know. Um, I didn't tell her, but I also felt, I understand what she's trying to, she's trying to get that story out, but this feels like so not the time to get that story out the morning after, is it? Yeah, that, I understand that because it was, oh my God, uh, it was like 500 reporters in the front yard after Columbine, wanting a story, acting like kids, acting a fool. And it was one reporter, one reporter came up and said, how your family is doing? I said, we're making it through, we're blessed, we're being strong. Why don't you come in? And she got to cover me with uh, Martin Luther King, uh, June III, Martin Luther King III, Abernathy, and she has pictures. We gave them the whole family story. She got, I think she did a book or something. Yeah. <laughs> I lost contact. But I gave her all rights to, because I liked her, she was true to heart. How is your family doing? You know, instead of flashing pictures and of what happened and all that, how's the family doing, first of all? That was her approach. So she was, a, I took her to events with me so she could get the stories. And, and it's the first approach, I, I'm telling you. I mean, like he said, it was, personal, you came up, the reporters attack you, but it's, if you sit there and be quiet, instead of rushing somebody, you gonna, somebody gonna see, oh my God, they're sympathizing or whatever, for an example, you know, that's the one that I go up, and maybe I needed a hug or something, that's the reporter I go up and, and would talk to. That's why I shine away from so many interviews, you know, because the, you want a story. It's people here, it's lives. It's things to be told, it's truth. So you can tell, like I said, five, 10 minutes into an interview, you can tell if you're gonna stop talking or you're gonna open up. Joe, has, has the field changed in your time? I just wanna know, I'm sorry, we'll get back out here in a second, but has, so, so in this whole notion of, the thing that's happened in the theater is that we see more and more and more theater that is uh, documentary journalism theater. And in some ways, the balance has switched. 
news has become more entertainment, it seems, in yes. many ways, <laughs> and theater has become more journalism. Yes. And is that something that you've been feeling in your, um, from your side of it, or is that just something I'm seeing in, from my theater chair? No, um, <laughs> print is just going out the door. Uh, print has been the main format of uh, journalism schools telling, uh, learning how to tell stories, but now we have video presentations. You can't really graduate just in print today. You have to graduate in multimedia, and so you've got documentaries, and you've got new formats. You've got, next week I'm going to a comic, uh, a comic uh, seminar where comics are used to tell stories. Com there are journalism comics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are, there are people like TJ who has sort of married the two, entertainment and journalism. Mm -hmm. What I saw last night was journalism. Yeah. Except for the first play, the first act, which was fictionalized, but the first act was sort of a pre seed the background that you needed in order to be able to understand the events in the second and the third act, which, which was all journalism. And so, basically what I saw last night was a journalistic play, if you can call it that. So yeah, there is a huge emphasis on entertainment, because we just spend tons and tons of money on entertainment, more than even gasoline. And, uh, and so journalists are really, they have this burden to be entertaining. And in many ways, that is the reason that we come to you for those nuggets. I'm just dry, dying to ask PJ, but I won't, maybe one of you, what those interesting, really interesting stories were that he found uh, anonymously at, at uh, Littleton that he can't tell, but I'm just dying to find out. <laughs> uh, you know, He'll never tell. You'll never tell me. <laughs> anyway, but can I say one thing? I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes, as being a victim, sometimes uh, we just want to talk. You know, somebody, we have a million people to talk, but not really. I mean, we can talk at a lot of people, but we, not, we find it hard to talk to a lot of people. Like I talk to PJ and he listened and you could trust him and he gets the inside story. And and most people want the truth to come out and with, when you can talk at somebody, you don't even know if they're gonna tell the truth. So if you talk to somebody and they can feel it and they just wanna tell their story and that's when they relax and open up to you from a personal view. <laughs> Uh, we go there? So many questions, I hope I we have know. time. We'll, we'll, we'll keep our answers brief. Okay. <laughs> Hi. No, I'm telling myself, because I'm in cafe here. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I think it's very admirable that you um, are so willing to share your story so openly. Um, I'm just wondering if you've ever faced any kind of criticism from family members who don't feel that it's right to be sharing the story so openly. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, the Colvine families, we have came uh, together as a family. They're my extended family, so anything I want to share with them, they would love it. They don't care. They trust me, and that's when the trust factor comes. I can tell their kids' story. I can tell their story, and you can print it, and they will be happy because it came from the heart. We have to trust each other. We have built that trust between among us that we can tell somebody else's story without them being pre present and they won't get mad. Good, you got that point out. So yeah, at privilege, you have to know what to share and what not to share. With PJ, I share everything. <laughs> but he knows the whole story of a lot of us, but it's a privilege, you know, and, and if I think it's gonna help some body I'm gonna tell it that's my whole purpose if you're telling a story and it's not gonna help anybody or relate to my story what's the use you know I think that's a good question because can I put this to you you probably know what happened in Lexington High School a couple yeah. of years three years ago you do Betty do you know the story yes. Lexington High School I, I, most of the tragedies now somebody contact me I don't I'm not the one to run my mouth all the time. I'm there to pray with them. I'm there to talk them through that. You know, someone being there, like I said, an open ear, they'll call me or something. I'll be happy to go there. You know, I don't want the media. I'm not going there for the media just, mm -hmm. 
you know, some people do that, but me personally, I sneak in or out, <laughs> whatever, because I true and heart want to be there for that person because I done went through that. And I will share, you know, my experiences. I'll be there for them to, to I mean, I'll be there for them to talk and I can hear. You, you and if I could say anything, I will. You told me a very, very, I thought was funny story about Aurora because it, you, yeah, Aurora yeah. is so, so close to Betty. Um, when Aurora mm -hmm. happened, you, I remember you said, you know, I went down there to the memorial. They, they did a, a memorial, a makeshift mm -hmm. memorial right by the, the theater, which is so close to Betty's house. And you said, you said, people asked you, are you Betty Schills? And you're like, I don't know who that woman is. <laughs> because Betty wanted to just be there to be with the people having gone through. Be there to, I went and I wanted to, you know, just embrace because a hug could help someone or, you know, knowing somebody there to been through that or tell them how, you know, to start thinking because a lot of people's minds are straight off or, to be there to help them through that. You know, I wanted to be there personally. I didn't want to be there to be on TV. <laughs> and if I had saw the right reporter uh, or somebody, I would invite them in and so they could have somebody to talk to tell their story to. But me, you know, it's true at heart. If they feel like that, they're gonna tell everything and how it happened and how they're feeling, you know, and you should, and not to be there to block what they're saying, you know, like, so the story can go your way, yeah. the way you think it should go. And it's not the right way, because everybody out here anyway can tell that you're making up things and it's not true, it don't even sound true. So <laughs> why even bother? That's the, what I got out of everything. That's why I stopped doing interviews and things. I derailed us on the Lexington question, though I want to oh, get sure. back to that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Joe, you had a question on that. Uh, well, no, Lexington was a good example of your question. It was basically, do you know what Lexington, what happened in Lexington? There was a high school student who saw the play in the summer somewhere up here in Boston, and she wanted to uh, produce that play at her school, Lexington High School. She was a junior there at the time. I think this was about 2011, so that's three, two years ago. And uh, she was stopped. She had gone through the whole, a lot of, she had done a lot, weeks of work pr producing the play. And, and high school student, uh, high school principal said, sorry, her name was Emma, Emma Feinberg, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, sorry, Emma, it's not gonna happen. And Emma was upset, she objected. And that argument between her and the school actually spread to the rest of the Boston community. And it went on, the ACLU got involved, it went on WBUR, you know what WBUR is, it's the affiliate of NPR here. And uh, we used to, uh, a lot of media, including the Boston Globe, did stories on it. And the, uh, there was a professor, a drama professor from Boston University that stepped out of the limelight and offered to put on the play, offered to help Emma put on the play with the help of uh, a local theater company. And it went on. But it was an example of how people are afraid of this event. Now, if you were a parent of Lexington High School, you know, you would probably be very worried about your children being victims of another Columbine in Lexington. So there is that copycat element that you quickly alluded to, and there's also foul language. You know, if I use yeah. that language in the classroom, I would have been, I would be fired, okay, but, or, or suspended. So there are, and it's also very R-rated material. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of concerns, but at the same time, you have to weigh the cats what we're talking about today. And I, and I had these concerns when I was thinking about whether I should get involved in this with this event or not. And my concerns were quickly washed away. But because of people like PJ, I, if you see his play, it is very uplifting, it is very positive, it is uh, very educational, it will make you it will probably make the average person, I'm not talking about the 10% of people who will need medication, uh, uh, and, and there are definitely those people, but for the average person, for 87% of the population, you will come away feeling really, really strongly that this thing should never happen, certainly by not your hand. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Oh yeah, sorry. Can I say something? Uh, did you tell them about the reaction of the high school students at, at in Chicago. I went to Chicago with PJ when he, the play was there. 
and I was honored enough to go to the inner city schools, and they had the experience of doing their own version of the play, and the impact it made on them, uh, that's why I'm so excited about this, uh, being brought here at Boston, because the impact it made on inner city kids, I mean, they was thinking, and they were sitting there and talking to me, they had such, such a insight on uh, the way you do things wrong, what makes them react wrong. It, it made such an impact on these kids that they said it wasn't any help, you know, for them. And they were sitting there and we just had conversations and I loved it. I loved the impact it made on these young people. And, and as I hear, they still contact me, which I love that. I love kids. <laughs> so It's interesting because in these high schools, you know, they're, it, they're, all of the high schools are in low income neighborhoods and the gang, uh, the gang violence is in every one of these high schools. And so theoretically, right, we should never do a play about violence in a high school where you have gangs. Well, the complete opposite happens oh, yes. because it opens the conversation up and the kids are talking to each other with adults in the room. Um, yes, they might be saying some foul words, but they're talking, they're actually talking and you're getting it out. And the irony of this play is that in the inner city environment, I mean, the impact that, not, I mean, the play just sparks conversation. The real thing is that, what, what Betty's saying, the conversation that happened, you start to get that out, the misperceptions, the mis things that you think about me across the room and why I hate you and why this and that, all that starts to get out, which is what the, what's the pressure cooker that leads to violence is because you're not communicating, you know? It, the irony of in a place like Lexington or some other communities where the play has been banned, you know, it, it's so ridiculous that that's the complete opposite. It's a you know middle class you know suburban environment, you know that's that's you know that's where the play you think would be done, you know where there's not really a danger of violence. It's just ridiculous. Can I say right? add on to him? But every in the play, I'm not going to tell the play because some haven't saw it. But everybody. Yeah, um, everybody can relate to part of the play. This is the exciting part about it. Some, everybody can relate to something in the play, and that's what the exciting part about it. The kids can relate. They can see themselves in part of the play. You know, it's about life itself in general, and it's great being young and, and everything. So I, I was excited because some of the kids still call me. <laughs> so, that was six months Facebook ago. Facebook and all that. But uh, so, I mean, it, it's exciting because they got an insight. There is more like me. There's more kids going through what I'm going to. Because you have to realize a lot of kids don't have people they can go to at home. They have to have something to relate to. And I think this is a great thing that they can actually relate to this. Oh, there's a lot of people out there that's going through the same thing. Oh, that, I can put that in the play what I'm going through. So I, I'm excited about the play because it, it how it impacted those students. So that uh, you can, you can like PJ did, he don't like for me to say things like this, but uh, I, it made a great impact, and it, it's, it's great they're thinking in a different direction. Yeah. Okay. We, had, we have probably one more. All right. <laughs> uh, Somebody from your class. PJ, <laughs> what, uh, let's see. Uh, you want to you go ahead? Yeah. Uh, hi, Betty. Hi, PJ. Hi. Hello. Uh, this, you say that you can pretty much pick apart a person in 10 minutes just by saying with them, talking with them you know, see what their intentions are and trusting them. Yes. You've had to do a lot, you guys have had to do a lot of soul searching, you know, within, within these families, within, you know, the media and, the, you know, other people, and I guess within yourselves too, over the past, you know, guys, 14 years now. Yes. What did you guys have to put together in your, in your minds? You know, when it come, when it came to you know evaluating evaluating these people yourselves, your emotions, intentions, everything. What what had to come together to you know make you the way that you are today? 
I feel if a person approach me and they, I don't care if you don't like me, I don't care if you hate me, I don't care, but come to me right. Come to me and tell me these things. Tell me how you feel. You can yell at me and you might be my best friend tomorrow. <laughs> tell me how you feel and let us work out the differences. You know, tell me if you think I'm ugly, you don't like me because I'm black, which I've happened. One guy is my best friend now. He came to me, I don't like you because you, you know, I'm black, you know, I'm African American. And that's all right, because I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to approach you, and I'm going to get you to like me because I'm going to love you no matter how you approach me. It don't matter, but I like to know the true person. In other words, I like to know the true person. You don't have to like me to uh, do a thing together to get the successful end to a a matter you don't have to like me approach me in the right way because I can tell anyway so that's the secret of uh, people like me you have to approach me correctly and if I'm doing something wrong tell me about it come up us at me and and we're gonna correct it you know maybe I correct myself but uh, that's honesty you know well, I really, I, I knew that we needed all day to talk about it. <laughs> I, I just knew it because I, I can see it in your faces and in your hands. I really appreciate uh, your presence here and your sharing with us. We have, uh, I certainly have learned a lot. And if I would do cover Columbine today, I would uh, change my style a little bit just so that you would talk to me. Uh, <laughs> because you probably would have been one of the people who, who hung up on me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, never, I never called Betty, by the way. I called other people. Um, but, but thank you so much. It was a great play. I encourage everybody to go see this because uh, I wish I saw the play before I covered the event or the series of the months of uh, coverage. And it was very informational. It's very thoughtful, very well done. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, before you go, uh, there are many more questions. Uh, we probably don't have time to take them all uh, even formally. Uh, at HowlRound.com, uh, which is where HowlRound uh, TV and the Center for Theater Commons, there is this, uh, this event it has uh, been uh, streamed and it will, it's sitting there on the blog. And the comment stream there is a great place to leave questions and we'll direct them to Betty and to PJ and we'll get you answers that way. Um, so if you don't get your question into the room today, then put it on the on HowlRound. Do you know how to spell it? H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D dot com. Okay? Uh, and that's the Center for Theater Commons, and it's here at Emerson. The other announcement, for those of you who are interested in this stuff, whether from the journalism side or from the theater side, we just added another screening of a, a great documentary called Truth in Translation. And it's a piece um, that is, a, <laughs> we just added it, yeah, for the same reasons. It has the same kind of power uh, in this very intersection. It's a piece that Global Arts Corps made to document their piece called Truth in Translation, which is a play that they did where they uh, created a play based on the translators of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. And so the play is the attempt to get at the truth of what happened in dismantling apartheid, what had happened during apartheid. And then the play goes on the road, and they take it to Rwanda, they take it to Belfast, they take it to the Balkans. And the actors in that company then start running into all of these other conflict zones and the way that conflicts aren't the same, and the way that they as actors are changed by coming into contact with other people's truths, and the way that their ability to be objective about their own truth starts to fall apart. So it's a really, uh, extraordinary document documentary. It's only one more time, Saturday night at 7.30 in the screening room, uh, and the filmmakers are there. Uh, so if you're interested in this intersection, that's another great conversation starter and another uh, place to ask questions about this area. David, PJ, thanks so much. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's also talking on a panel across the street at the Majestic on uh, race and class disparities in, in uh, the media's treatment of uh, gun violence. So uh, that panel is hot. That, that panel has got some 